Street of Juan de Fuca. Small craft advisory in effect Saturday morning through Saturday afternoon. Gale warning in effect from Saturday afternoon through early Sunday morning. Saturday, southwest wind 20 to 30 knots, rising 30 to 45 knots in the afternoon. Wind waves 3 to 4 feet, building 4 to 7 feet. To those on the water, the lighthouse is a welcome sight as weather in this area is not always polite. In 1872, the Secretary of the Interior asked the U.S. Lighthouse Board to find suitable locations in the San Juan Islands. The Board identified 23 potential sites to provide for all probable events. The five sites chosen for major lights were Cattle Point and Lime Kiln Point on San Juan Island, Alden Point on Patos Island, Turn Point on Stewart Island and Burroughs Island. These five lights form a ring guiding mariners through the surrounding straits. In 1853, the Hudson Bay Company started Bellevue Farm near the southern end of San Juan Island. They brought sheep and cattle from Vancouver Island, landing them on the dock near that point. Later, a vessel ran aground nearby, and its load of cattle were forced to swim ashore. The following year, the peninsula showed up on British charts as Cattle Point. The first light at the point was a simple brass lantern on a post, lit in October of 1888. George Jekyll, a soldier who had been stationed at American camp, was hired to maintain the light. Jekyll farmed on the southern end of San Juan Island after leaving the army and grazed sheep on the sandy grasslands. As light keeper, he would trim the wick and polish the glass every day. The lantern's kerosene reservoir needed filling about once a week. He was resupplied at regular intervals at a spot later known as Jekyll's Lagoon. The U.S. Navy installed a radio compass station east of the light in 1921 and built similar stations at Smith Island and New Dungeness Spit. Listening to these three stations, mariners could, using triangulation, figure out exactly where they were even in the thickest fog. The Navy built a transmitting station with two antenna towers, a concrete powerhouse, and living quarters for the sailors assigned there. The radio station closed in 1937, and all that remains today is the concrete shell of the powerhouse. Ethel, a native of San Juan Island, was courted by a young Navy cook, Kenneth Martin, who was assigned to the station. She visited often and joined picnic lunches prepared by him. When Martin was transferred in 1927, he and Ethel were married. After World War II, Kenneth retired from the Navy and he and Ethel moved back to San Juan Island where they operated a restaurant in Friday Harbor. In 1935, the brass lantern was replaced by a 34-foot octagonal tower. The lighthouse received a temporary makeover in the mid-1980s when it was used as a backdrop for a television commercial. The tower was outfitted with a fake lantern room and a hip roof for the filming, confusing many a lighthouse buff who saw the commercial. The 400-acre Burroughs Island near Anacortes provides a location that can be seen from a wide area. In 1903, a wood-framed lighthouse was built using a design by Carl Like, who also designed one at Mukilteo. The Post-Intelligencer published a spirited article in 1906. The Fog Signal Station is a model plant and contains all the latest improvements. 
A 14-foot horn is used to sound the fog warnings instead of a bell, and the contrivance is operated by two powerful gasoline engines. Remarkably, during the first three months of operation, the fog signal never had to be used, but the next year, it blew for 329 hours. Famous for planting flower gardens at the lights he tended, James Harriman and his assistant, Edward Pfaff, were the first keepers. The station consisted of a lighthouse itself, a boathouse, a shop, a massive duplex residence. A power plant was eventually added to provide electricity, and every few months, the tender fur delivered supplies. In 1934, the keeper ordered a milk cow. The delivering tug was towing a barge with a cow on it. When about a mile short of the island, the cow jumped into the water. A rope was thrown around the cow's horns, allowing the tug to complete the journey with the cow cutting the water with her nose. The lighthouse service was absorbed by the Coast Guard in 1939. A small house was then added for the officer in charge and his family. While serving two-year tours, two other Coast Guardsmen and their families took up residence in the duplex. Forty acres and a thousand feet of shoreline around Burroughs Island Lighthouse were given to the Washington State Parks and Recreation Department in 1978, and the state has since acquired the rest of the island to create Burroughs Island State Park. The Northwest Schooner Society has taken over conservation of the lighthouse station and is working to restore it to its former glory. The Spanish explorers named the northernmost of the San Juan Islands, Isla de Patos, the Island of Ducks. The Lighthouse Board wanted a light established on the west end of the island to complement the one on Canada's Saturna Island. The light and foghorn began operation in November 1893 with a red lantern used to contrast to the white light used by the Canadians. A two-story complex was built nearby to house the light keepers and their families. In November of 1908, the red lens lantern on Patos was replaced by a Fresnel lens installed in a 38-foot tower. The new rotating lens was illuminated by oil-burning wicks and produced a flash every five seconds. It was turned by a combination of weights and chains, just like a grandfather's clock. Edward Durgan was assigned to be the head keeper in 1905. He lived there with his wife Estelle and their 13 children. They rode the 26 miles to Bellingham about once a month for supplies. They kept cows, pigs, and chickens for fresh eggs and meat. Tragedy struck the Durgan family when seven of the children came down with a chicken pox and only four survived. Since there was no radio or telephone, the Durgans flew the U.S. flag upside down to signal passing chips that they were in need of help. Beautiful as the setting was, the nearby caves and coves were used by smugglers. As part of his duties, the keeper had to convince them not to use the island as a base. Most of the contraband came from Canada and included wool, liquor, and Chinese laborers. Durgan's daughter, Helene, later wrote a book about their life on Patos, The Light on the Island. A blend of fact and fiction is a compelling story of their life from a child's perspective. The station was automated in 1974 and all of the buildings except the original lighthouse and tower were removed. Ships sailing in the Harrow Strait have to make a sharp change of course at the western tip of Stewart Island, aptly named Turn Point. Because of this forced turn, it is a very dangerous spot at night or in bad weather. Turn Point Station began operations on November 30, 1893, the same day as Pato's Island Light. The light consisted of a white lantern on a post, and when needed, a steam-powered Dable horn sounded a three-second blast every 30 seconds. Peter Christensen, a Norwegian immigrant, 
was assigned as lighthouse keeper in 1894. He moved from Oakland, California with his pregnant wife, Theodine, and a daughter, Anna. Charlie Christensen, born two months after the couple's arrival, was the first white child born on Stewart Island. Edward Durgan was promoted from assistant at nearby Patos Island to head keeper at Turn Point in 1895. On February 16, 1897, Durgan and Christensen heard a distress whistle from the tugboat Enterprise that ran aground near the island. The keepers plunged into the water and physically freed the tug. The captain appeared to be the only person on board until seven drunken crew members were found below deck. To add to the excitement, one of the sailors brandished a butcher knife and threatened his rescuers. The captain was able to subdue the sailor and locked him in the light station's chicken coop until sobered up. For their efforts, Durgan and Christensen received a letter of commendation from the U.S. Navy. The fog signal was typically in operation about 200 hours each year, but in 1896, it ran for 929 hours. Louis Borchers arrived at Turn Point in 1902 as assistant keeper and was promoted to head keeper in 1906. During World War I, keepers were encouraged to cultivate gardens to offset food shortages. Gardening wasn't practical at Turn Point because it was all rock, but Borchers did his part by canning fish. During one season, he made 311 cans of sockeye, pink, and smoked salmon, sardines, and salmon caviar. While the light is still under Coast Guard control, the buildings are in the care of the Turn Point Lighthouse Preservation Society, who maintain them and offer guided tours. The last major lighthouse established in Washington State was at Lime Kiln Point. The name came from the Lime Quarry operation a quarter mile to the north. The first light came on in 1914 when the settling gas lamps were placed on a post. The current light tower went into operation in June 1919 using kerosene lamps. The tower's lantern room was fabricated by Wisconsin Iron and Wire Works of Milwaukee and the light produced a group of three flashes every 10 seconds. Two lighthouse keepers were required to keep constant vigils and alternating 12-hour shifts seven days a week. For this, they received a salary of $800 a year. From 1935 to 1945, Arville Settles was the keeper with his wife, Helga, and their five children. While working at Gray's Harbor Lighthouse, his son John developed asthma. The district superintendent suggested they move to Lime Kiln Lighthouse with its drier climate where John recovered nicely. There was no way to electrify the station as the local power company could not provide sufficient current. Helga remembered living without electricity. I had to wash on a scrub board and we would wind the mechanism to turn the light by hand. Despite the lack of electricity, Helga loved living at the lighthouse. She had a big vegetable garden and enjoyed growing flowers. Though Helga did not help with the lighthouse duties, the children did. When the light mechanism needed winding, Arville would pay them 10 cents to do it. Charlie Settles recalled his boyhood there. We were out in the water a lot. When old boats would wash up on shore, he and his older brother Joe would revitalize them. One day, the boys were out rowing when a small whale chased them. They saw the fin come close, and oh, did we go, we made the water fly. Power lines finally reached the lighthouse in 1951. The 36-acre reservation was transferred to Washington State in 1984 and named Lime Kiln Point State Park. In 1998, the light was replaced with a modern light, flashing white once every 10 seconds and visible for 15 nautical miles. While the light is still under the jurisdiction of the Coast Guard, the Friends of Lime Kiln Society provide an educational and inspirational experience for visitors. 
The sentinels of the San Juans have guided mariners through howling gale, obliterating fog, and widely varying tides at all hours of the day and night. They will stand for many more years a welcome sight, protecting us and providing for all probable events.